W. Paul Reeve is the Simmons Mormon Studies Professor in the History Department at the University of Utah, where he teaches courses on Utah history, Mormon history, and the history of the U.S. West. Now, normally, when we have a speaker, we will go through his uh, or her scholarly career, but I would actually like to start talking just a little bit about his teaching career because he's not only a noted scholar, he's also received many awards, including for his teaching. The Utah Council for the Social Studies University Teacher of the Year Award, uh, the University of Utah's Early Career Teaching Award, and the College of Humanities Ramona W. Cannon Award for Teaching Excellence in the Humanities. Um, I have a nephew who's in the graduate program in history at the U and who has studied with Professor Reeve, and this is what he said uh, about him. He is a patient advisor, unfailing colleague, and an example of how the best scholars balance excellent teaching, exceptional writing, and wise student mentoring. Um, now let me just say a couple of words about his scholarly career. He is the author of many scholarly articles and the author, editor of five books, including Making Space on the Western Frontier, Mormons, Miners, and Southern Paiutes, published by the University of Illinois Press in 2006. But of course, we're here for his latest book, right, Religion of a Different Color, Race, and the Mormon Struggle for Whiteness, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2015. This book received the Mormon History Association's Best Book Award, the John Whitmer Historical Association's Smith Pettit Best Book Award, and the Utah State Historical Society's Francis Armstrong Madsen Best History Book Award. Now, one of the impressive elements of Professor Reeve's scholarly work is that he's always interested in how his research into history has relevance to the issues we confront today as a society. And for example, you may have seen, if you read the Deseret News over the last couple of years, he has authored a couple of opinion pieces uh, on President Trump's travel ban, as well as the movement called Black Lives Matter, um, using his historical perspective to give uh, a different perspective on, on those two things. He is currently bu building a digital database, a century of black Mormons, to name and identify all known black Mormons between 1830 and 1930 so that we can remember and have a record of these all too forgotten pioneers. And I just want to add one note uh, about Professor Reeve's work and why we chose this book in the Kennedy Center as our book of the semester. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, attended the uh, remarkable and powerful forum last week by Brian Stevenson. And if you did, you'll remember that he gave four keys to helping make the world a better place through enacting social change and one of the things he said was by changing the narrative, right, that we need to leave behind the false narratives that we have constructed about, for example, race in our country and gain a better, more accurate understanding of how various groups within our society and communities have been treated. And I feel that uh, Professor Reeve's work concerning race within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and surrounding it helps us to take an important step in constructing a more accurate narrative about race in our own community. So please join with me in welcoming Professor Reeve to BYU. So I want to start today by thanking Dr. Stanley Benfell and the David N. Kennedy Center for International Studies for the invitation to speak and especially for the distinction of selecting religion of a different color as the book of the semester. I am truly honored. As I was uh, preparing my remarks for today, I couldn't help but to think back to when I was an undergraduate at BYU. I switched my major from accounting to computer science and then from computer science to history. Uh, as a newly declared history major, winter semester 1991, I enrolled in Dr. Marvin Hill's History 120 course. It was the introductory course to uh, American history required of majors, and it covered U.S. history through 1877 and the end of Reconstruction. As a new student in the program, I quickly learned that history majors at BYU had nicknamed Professor Hill, Dr. Hill from Hell. <laughs> he was incredibly demanding, but a wonderful professor. Uh, and I emerged from my short stay in Hell with a hard-won C+. <laughs> 
Many of my cohort retook the course from another professor in order to replace their low grades with a higher grade. I instead left the C plus on my transcript as a badge of honor of sorts. But more to the point for today, if any of you would have come to me that winter semester in 1991 and told me that in 2018, a history book that I wrote would be selected as a Kennedy Center's book of the semester, I would have told you you were crazy. Despite that difficult introduction to the major, I went on to learn the craft of history from the best collection of historians one could imagine, including Dr. Hill. I had classes from James Allen, Tom Alexander, Neil York, Brian Cannon, Martha Bradley Evans, Malcolm Thorpe, and Fred Gowans, among others. I truly learned from the best. I see the invitation to speak today as a tribute to them and the foundational education I received at BYU. When Dr. Benfeld extended his invitation to speak, he explained that the Kennedy Center's theme for the year centered on issues of social justice and wondered if I might consider religion of a different color in that light. In contemplating this topic, my mind took me back to the summer of 1976 when I was just shy of my eighth birthday. That summer I went on a pilgrimage with my family. It was a journey typical of those sometimes taken by members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as they visit various sites of Latter-day Saints, uh, uh, the Latter-day Saint Restoration. It included a visit to Nauvoo, well before Nauvoo became a living history village it is today. It also included several church history stops in Missouri. I don't recall much about that summer trip except for two moments that seemed forever frozen in my mind. Those two memories became lodged in my mind as far as I can tell, principally because they represent my first introduction to a concept I would come as an adult to understand as social justice. Of course, I did not know the language of social justice as an almost eight-year-old. I did not understand it as a set of principles dedicated to achieving fair and just relations between an individual and society. However, I did have a typical seven-year-old sense of what I understood to be fair and just. It was on those terms that I experienced what today I understand as my first introduction to feelings of social justice. The two moments from that trip that became anchored in my mind have certainly been shaped and reshaped by the passing of time and the accumulation of knowledge. I don't claim that what I remember today is what I experienced when I was seven. I do claim that the memories from those two days became fixed somewhere in my soul because they stirred in me unsettling questions that I continue to grapple with as an adult over 40 years later. One of those moments became frozen in time for me perhaps because these photographs preserved them as frozen moments. These photographs were taken July 8, 1976. I'm standing with my older brother, and a shout out to my nieces who are seeing their dad on the screen. Um, standing with my older brother and two cousins in front of the Simeon and Adeline Dunn home at Nauvoo. It is boarded up and abandoned. S Simeon Adams Dunn was my great-great-great-grandfather through my maternal line. His brother James introduced him to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Michigan, and he and his wife Adeline were baptized in 1839. Simeon walked 500 miles to Nauvoo in order to meet Joseph Smith for himself. Satisfied with what he found, he returned to retrieve his family, and in August 1840, they all journeyed to Illinois, where they bought land and built the brick home on Parley Street, in front of which I stood in 1976. That home has now been lovingly restored and serves as a residence for senior missionaries who live in Nauvoo. But when I was there in 1976, it was boarded up and empty. Family tradition is that Simeon and his family abandoned this home in 1846 as the saints left Nauvoo and began their migra migration westward. To my seven-year-old understanding, walking away from a home that you worked hard to build felt decidedly unjust. The boarded up windows and doors haunted me, and I wondered if Mary and Betsy, Simeon and Adeline's daughters, cried as they walked away. Adeline had died in 1841, but maybe Simeon cried too. How could that happen, I wondered. Where was justice for Simeon and his family? Who would make it right? From Illinois, we traveled to Missouri, and it was there that the second moment of our family pilgrimage became fixed in my mind. My recollection of this moment is admittedly vague, not aided by a photograph. I recall driving for what felt like a very long time to what seemed like nothing but a grassy field. Why had we come here, I wondered. 
There was nothing to see. My assessment was somewhat accurate from a seven-year-old's perspective, but there was something for me to feel. It was there in that grassy area that the keepers of the family stories, my mom and my aunt, shared the fate of several other of my ancestors with me. If my memory is accurate, it may have been the first time I heard the story of the Hans Mill Massacre, and I'm almost certain it was the first time I heard the phrase, Nitz make lice. My great-great-grandfather, Levi Newton Merrick, and his nine-year-old son, Charles, died at Hans Mill. Charles was one of three boys who joined some of the men in fleeing to the blacksmith shop as a place of protection and defense. It was a poor choice. Members of the Missouri militia poked their guns through the gaping holes between the logs that formed its walls and fired at point blank range. The three boys, Sardius Smith, age 10, Charles Merrick, nine, and Alma Smith, six, hid behind the bellows in the blacksmith shop, trembling with fear. Upon discovering them, militiamen blew off the upper part of Sardius' head, mortally wounded Charles in three places, leading to his death four weeks later, and wounded Alma in the hip. As justification for shooting the boys, one militiaman, William Reynolds, declared, Nitz will make lice, and if he had lived, he would have become a Mormon. A Mormon survivor recalled that the attackers spurred each other on with numerous murderous yells, kill them, damn them, kill them, Nitz make lice. For a seven-year-old, this was too much to take in. I don't recall the family version of events my mom and aunt shared that day. I only recall being petrified by imagining myself in Charles Merrick's shoes, experiencing the peril of being trapped behind the bellows in the blacksmith shop with men with guns shooting at me. I wondered what Charles must have felt that day and how much pain he must have endured over the ensuing four weeks before he finally died. No one was brought to justice for the massacre, an outcome that felt decidedly unfair to my seven-year-old sense of right and wrong. In recounting her loss, my great-great-grandmother, Felinda, wrote this. Among the dead was my husband, Levi N. Merrick, instantly killed, and also a child of mine, mortally wounded, who died about four weeks after. And the mob took two horses, 12 sheep, two guns, and some tools and clothing, which was worth no less than $300. And after all of this, I was ob obligated to get out of this state the best way I could. And now I have three fatherless children to maintain with my own hands labor. All the above loss and grievances happened because of our, our religion, so said the mob. Felinda thus offered one explanation for the persecution, but I still struggled to comprehend it. Those questions of fairness and justice, as well as the feelings of fear and loss, lingered with me and still haunt me today. Later, as an historian, I read the account of David Lewis, another survivor of the Missouri expulsion, who pondered the why and the how right along with me. As Lewis put it, quote, it was dreadful to tell the awfulness of our situation and this abuse we received from men of our own color and of our own nation, close quote. Implicit in his statement was the notion that violence and extermination typically happened along racial lines. And yet, in the case of the Latter-day Saint expulsion, it happened at the hands of men of our own color, something he struggled to explain. In essence, then, it was in the summer of 1976, as a seven-year-old pilgrim to Mormon holy sites, that I first formed one of my research questions for what became religion of a different color. It certainly became more refined over time, but one thing I hoped to learn was how one justifies killing people who look like you. Racial violence has permeated American soil from the first arrival of Europeans to the Americas and tragically persists to the present day. But as David Lewis noticed, noted, the abuse that Mormons received in Missouri was from men of our own color. My great-great-great-grandmother, Felinda, argued that one justification for the violence was religious. I believe that she was correct. Yet I have also come to believe that she was not entirely correct. As I conclude in the book, quote, religious freedom in America met its limits in the Mormons, but not without racial validations. In other words, one way you justify killing people who look like you is to suggest that they, in fact, do not look like you, that they were racially, not merely religiously different, and therefore you are justified in enacting discriminatory policies and practices against them, even state-sanctioned extermination. What I'd like to do today then is to share with you some of the evidence I uncovered to support these conclusions. And then I'd like to return to what this all might mean in terms of social justice and race in 2018. 
it's important uh, to keep in mind um, a framing element for the book. Uh, the evolutionary development theory was in operation in the 19th century. And so a religious and, and social thinkers believe that all societies passed along the same basic trajectory from savagery to barbarism and from barbarism to civilization. And as they did so, they left the markers of barbarism and savagery behind. And a couple of these markers were things such as adherence to despotic rule, as well as polygamy. And yet these same uh, racial and social thinkers looked in on the Mormons in the Great Basin and said these ostensibly white people are doing things that white people should not do. And in fact, are leading to uh, a degradation backwards from civilization into barbarism and into savagery. So those uh, principles are in operation across the course of the 19th century as outsiders struggle to make racial sense of who the Latter-day Saints were. Uh, so just as evidence for the ways in which Mormons are defined as other, not just religiously, but physically, uh, we can look at Dr. Charles Furley who uh, visits, he's an uh, army surgeon who visits uh, Salt Lake in 1863 and then files a report uh, with the army which gets picked up by a variety of medical journals uh, in the 19th century. Uh, this is how he described the Mormons. A marked physiological inferiority strikes the stranger from the first as being one of the characteristics of this people. A certain feebleness and emaciation of person is common amongst every class, age, and sex. In the faces of nearly all, one detects the evidences of conscious degradation or the bold and defiant look of habitual and hardened sensuality. There is a general lack of color, the cheeks of all being sallow and cadaverous, indicating an absence of good health. The eye is dull and lusterless, the mouth almost invariably coarse and vulgar. In fact, the features, the countenance, the whole face where the divinity of man should shine out is mean and sensual to the point of absolute ugliness. And a variety of medical journals picked up his report and published them uncritically. So with that as uh, a bit of background then, um, I used uh, this uh, political cartoon published in Life, Life Magazine in 1904 as the uh, organizational element for the book. And it's the cover, obviously, illustration uh, for the book. Uh, it's published in Life Magazine, 1904, simply titled, Mormon Elderberry Out With His Six-Year-Olds Who Take After Their Mothers. Life Magazine, I believe, is attempting to trap Mormonism in a suspect racial past at the same time that uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints is attempting to claim a white and pure future for itself. So they are imagining that Mormon polygamy is not merely destroying the traditional family. It's destroying the white race and making it unfit for democracy. Senator Calhoun argues on the floor of the United States Senate in uh, 1848, democracy is the government of the white race. And he argues that uh, people who are not white are inherently racially incapable of democracy. So when you project your fears of race mixing onto the Mormons, it's not just that you're fearful of a suspect religious group, you're fearful of the success of America's experiment in democratic government. So uh, keep that in mind, and then we'll just progress through the various children in Mormon Elderberry's imagined family to show the ways in which uh, they are racialized in the 19th century. So even if uh, you were white and of Northern European ancestry, you were still racially suspect if you converted to Mormonism. In 1856, a reporter for the New York Times visited Castle Garden, which was the precursor to Ellis Island, where immigrants uh, entered to uh, uh, the United States. And this reporter from the Times uh, uh, surveyed for his readers what the Mormon immigrants from Liverpool were like. He counted 454 Mormons who had recently arrived on the packet ship caravan. As he described it, they came from England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, and Denmark, but then noted that to the, to the credit of Denmark, there was only two Danish families amongst them. And to the credit of Ireland, there was only one Irishman. Even though the Mormon immigrants for, were from desirable parts of Europe, they were not deemed desirable. As the Times put it, our reporter saw these people, conversed with them, and estimated them intellectually and otherwise. They all belonged to the lower, almost to the lowest classes of society. The typical Welch peasant is notably clean, the New York Times declared. 
but the Mormon Welch peasants were dirty. A reporter uh, went on, normal Welch girls were distinguished by their very ruddy complexions, very wholesome appearance, and very staid and chaste manners. In contrast, the Welch girls who converted to Mormonism were neither ruddy, wholesome, nor staid. Some of them, the Times predicted, will perhaps be added to Brigham Young's harem within a few months. The English and Scots Mormons were no different. Their countenances were imbruted with ignorance and dirt, the Times said. Not the material dirt of a sea voyage, but the moral dirt of a life of imbecility and indolence. In total, the Times declared that among the whole 450, there were scarcely one face that showed that its possessor was greatly elevated above the animal. Dissipation had done its work with many. The Times speculated that most of the Englishmen had been too familiar with the gin palaces and beer shops of London, and the Scotsmen likewise appeared to have drank deep of whiskey. Perhaps it was a case of foreign countries dispatching their prodigal sons to other lands to get rid of them, the reporter guessed. All of this left the Times to project, quote, if Salt Lake City is wholly peopled by individuals of the average of intellect possessed by the newly arrived immigrants, we should, following the law of depreciation, expect that in a century it would be merely a congregation of apes with tails, close quote. And uh, this becomes a theme across the course of the 19th century, racializing northern European Mormon immigrants. Uh, this is published in uh, Frank Leslie's Illustrated, uh, a New York pictorial magazine in March of 1882, simply labeled Women's Bondage in Utah, the Mormon solution of the cheap labor question. You can see in the upper corner, this is how uh, they imagine, the illustrator imagines Mormon's uh, missionary work uh, taking place in Europe. So you have the Mormon agent's delusive bait. He's luring the unsuspecting female converts, uh, promising them a happy home out west, and yet it's really a trap of degradation and polygamy. And once they arrive, we can see what actually happens to them. The lecherous, lascivious male patriarch, uh, sitting idle, uh, holding the whip of intimidation uh, while his wives all work and they are chained with um, the ball and chain of ignorance and sealed uh, to the lecherous patriarch and you'll notice the wooden shoes marking them as foreign and other. You'll also notice then uh, the African American man uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation tucked under his arm even African Americans have more freedom than the white slaves in Utah Territory. Uh, so this is the system of uh, immigration that outsiders are imagining uh, Mormons facilitating. Mormons, or excuse me, outsiders also imagine uh, Mormons facilitating race mixing between black and white. And uh, the illustration I'll use is uh, the actual imagination of Brigham Young presiding over an interracial family. In 1872, uh, he is arrested and hauled off to jail for uh, lascivious cohabitation. Uh, and so Frank Leslie's budget of fun uh, imagined what the scene must have looked like. Uh, they titled their political cartoon, Affecting Parting of Brigham Young from His Interesting Little Family. But what's so interesting about Brigham Young's family is the first wife reaching out to him is a stereotypical black mammy from the plantation style. And other wives in his family are also black as well as uh, some of the children. Even some of the white wives and children, however, bear the mark of racial degradation. They're drawn explicitly uh, to mimic ape-like or simian features, suggesting that Brigham Young and his own family is presiding over the degradation of the white race. Uh, Native Americans are also conflated with uh, Latter-day Saints in the 19th century. And there are three basic ways that this takes place. Outsiders suggest that uh, Latter-day Saints conspire with Native Americans against true white Americans, that they intermarry amongst them, once again degradating the white race, and that they in fact descend below the level of the savages to, to become more savage than the savages. So three political cartoons uh, illustrate these three uh, uh, themes that emerge in the 19th century. So this is published by Harper's Weekly in February of 1882, uh, and it depicts uh, what's called the polygamous barbarian, uh, the white Mormon holding the gun, and this is what he is saying to the Native American. Much guns, much ammunition, much whiskey, and much kill, pale face. 
So in this uh, imagination, then, Latter-day Saints are depicted as conspiring with Native, Native Americans, plying them with guns, ammunition, and whiskey, and conspiring with them to kill true white Americans. And you see then um, the Native Americans' hands dripping with blood, and US soldiers strewn about the ground, and the Salt Lake Tabernacle in the background. Race mixing, once again, is uh, one of the accusations uh, leveled against Latter-day Saints. Now, they do take, uh, some Latter-day Saints do take Native American wives uh, in the 19th century as a part of Mormonism's own effort at racial uplift. Uh, but Mark Twain uh, imagines that taking place in Brigham Young's family. Uh, in his book, Roughing It, uh, published in 1872, he uh, describes this scene wherein a woman and a child show up at Brigham Young's household. She says, I'm one of your wives. He has so many wives, he can't remember her, but of course, uh, welcomes her into the family, uh, sends the child off to uh, get cleaned up, and when they came to wash the paint off that child, it was an Indian. And the illustration says a remarkable resemblance. Uh, in other words, it's Brigham Young's child, and he is fathering again. Uh, the degradation of the white race. And then uh, <clears throat> the last thing that comes through, uh, simply that uh, Mormons uh, become uh, Native Americans. Uh, this is uh, a dime novel published in 1855. Uh, the illustration is simply titled Mormons Disguised as Indian Spies. So the two Native Americans in the foreground are actually Mormons. Uh, and then the story says that one of the characters in the novel has been killed and then explains the death this way. It was stated that the Indians had killed him, but one of the picadillos of the Mormons consists in disguising themselves in Indian costume and waylaying such persons as are obnoxious to them and putting them to death. Numbers were known to have disappeared in this manner. The blame then fell upon the Indians. Even those poor savages were incapable of committing deeds so infamous, so bloodthirsty, and so cruel as were a common practice of the Mormon elders under the name of religion. So in these depictions, then, Latter-day Saints become more savage than the savages. And uh, <clears throat> Latter-day Saints also are then conflated with uh, especially Chinese immigrants who are entering uh, the West Coast, but also uh, Muslims and Turks as uh, uh, one way of suggesting that uh, Mormonism is not Christian, it's more Eastern than it is Western. Uh, so some of those uh, examples come from publications on the West Coast, uh, especially as Congress is trying to figure out what to do what, with what is labeled the Chinese problem and the Mormon problem, they get conflated in national politics uh, from the 1870s through the 1880s. So. Uh, the WASP publishes uh, this illustration called three, The Three Troublesome Children. The Native American is labeled the Indian question, and the Native American child is tomahawking U.S. soldiers to death. Uh, and then the Asian child is labeled the China question, pulling on Lady Columbia's hair. And uh, the Mormon child is simply labeled the Mormon question, spitting in Columbia's face. Uncle Stam is too pre preoccupied with politics to pick up the whip of law, which uh, is, is hanging unused on the back of his chair. Uh, and then the other depiction shows Uncle Sam's nightmare. He's weighted down by the Chinese problem and polygamy. Will he be able to wake up and throw off these vaccine problems? Uh, the Wasp, again, in uh, February of 1879, um, simply titled Uncle Sam's Troublesome Bedfellows. You see the drunk Irishman, uh, <clears throat> the African American who's happy to be included in the bed uh, at all, the Native American who's sticking his finger in Uncle Sam's ear, but once again, the Chinese immigrant and the Mormon polygamist uh, being booted from Uncle Sam's bed altogether. And then uh, as Congress continues to debate what were defined as the Chinese and Mormon problems, a variety of newspapers conflate those two in the 19th century. So just some examples. The Milwaukee Daily Sentinel called them the vexed Chinese and Mormon questions. The Boston Daily Advertiser uh, argued it's vastly more important to suppress Mormon than Chinese immigration as far as the moral welfare of the nation is concerned. The Daily Alta California, Chinese and Mormons, two classes of people who must be made to go. 
The independent statesmen in Concord, New Hampshire called them the Chinese and Mormon problems. The Silver Reef miner in Silver Reef, Utah uh, argued polygamy and the Chinese must go. The Idaho avalanche uh, called them the Mormon and Chinese curses. And the National Republican published in Washington, D.C. said there is one good thing that can be said about the Chinese, none of them are Mormons. The Salt Lake Tribune doesn't want to be left out. If there is any sound reasons for the exclusion of the Chinese from this country, there is for the exclusion of the Mormons. And uh, the Sedalia Weekly Bazoo in Missouri, we can stand the Chinese, but no Mormon polygamists. And a variety of other ways uh, outsiders in the 19th century look in on the Latter-day Saints and say that they are more Oriental or Eastern than they are Western. Uh, a lot of them conflate Salt Lake City with an Eastern city. Uh, so uh, 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 a dime novel published in 1882, Turkey is in our midst. Modern Mohammedism has its Mecca at Salt Lake. Uh, the New York Daily Tribune and the Salt Lake Tribune um, also picked up on this theme of Mormons giving their free will over to the despots, Brigham Young and Joseph Smith. So they are uh, they use Eastern metaphors to describe them. Uh, Mormons gave their free will over to His Supreme Highness Sultan Brigham and Joseph Smith, the Vice Regent of Almighty God, the modern Muhammad of Mormon Allah. Uh, and then uh, more sophisticated individuals, Francis Lieber, a professor of history and political science at South Carolina College, begin to argue that in fact polygamy and monogamy are racial. Monogamy is the preserve of the white race, and anything that is not monogamous is a deterioration away from that. Uh, he argues um, against the admission of Utah into the sisterhood of states based on this ground, these grounds. Monogamy goes beyond our religion. It is a law written in the heart of our race, the special domain of the Western Caucasian. Monogamy was one of the pre-existing conditions of our existence as civilized white men and together with the endeavor to establish political liberty, it constituted two of the main distinctions between Asiatic and European mankind. So maybe all of these are just fodder in newspapers, but in fact, they end up mattering uh, when the Supreme Court makes its decision uh, in the Reynolds case uh, in 1879, uh, the first time it hears a polygamist uh, test case it draws upon the same arguments. Uh, so uh, Chief Justice Morrison Waite in Reynolds versus the United States argues, and he actually cites Francis Lieber, the person I just quoted, uh, this notion uh, that monogamy is for the white race. Um, polygamy has always been odious among the northern and western nations of Europe, and until the establish establishment of the Mormon church was almost exclusively a feature of the life of Asiatic and of African people. So uh, when we understand what racism looked like when it was aimed at us Latter-day Saints, even the ones who were white, I hope we are better prepared to confront the racism we in turn perpetuated on others. You have then one way in which you claim whiteness for yourself in the 19th century is in distance from those you are being conflated with. And you see that taking place across the course of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, the most significant way you claim whiteness for yourself is especially in distance from blackness. And you see Mormonism moving away from their own black converts uh, towards race-based priesthood and temple restrictions firmly in place by the beginning of the 20th century. But just some examples of the ways in which then uh, Latter-day Saints turn their lens on others and find, uh, use the same kind of racialized language to describe others and claim whiteness for themselves in the process. Uh, the contributor, uh, a 19th century LDS magazine, sent G.H. Snell uh, on ramblings around the world. And every month, he would send back reports from his uh, travels around the globe in 1893 and 1894. And I just pulled out the ones where he is describing his visit to China. He described Chinese passengers on board ship as, mongrel, as a mongrel, motley, and villainous horde. He found China to be a very filthy empire filled with citizens who were bloody, cruel, and cold to each other. And when he left China, he described himself as tired out and disenchanted with the whole Chinese empire in its almond-eyed race. And then um, 
Brigham Young on Native Americans. Uh, sometimes he's preaching that they are fallen descendants of ancient Israel, but other times he uses the language of savagery. When we are located in the midst of savage tribes who for generations untold have been taught to rob, plunder, and kill, they are moreover ignorant and degraded, living in the lowest degree of filthiness, practicing extreme barbarity. Uh, he instructed settlers in southern Utah in 1851 to be on guard against, quote, the children of the Gideon robbers who had infested the mountains for more than a thousand years and had lived by plundering all the time. So instead of uh, fallen descendants of ancient Israel, in fact, descendants of Gideon robbers, perhaps beyond redemption's reach. And then, uh, of course, Brigham Young uh, speaks out most stridently uh, uh, in terms of his estimation of who African Americans were. Uh, in 1852, as the territorial legislature debates the election bill for Utah Territory, Brigham Young says, we just as well make a bill here for mules to vote as Negroes or Indians. You cannot find within men upon the earth who are of the seed of Cain any that possess knowledge and sensibility enough to vote. What we are trying to do today is to make the Negro equal with us in all our privileges. My voice shall be against it all the day long, he says in 1852. And in response to Cain killing Abel, Young asserted that God said, I will put a mark on him. It is the flat nose and black skin. So let me now then return uh, to where we began. And in the book, you have sort of the academic conclusion, uh, which is aimed at an academic audience. Uh, this is the conclusion for the book uh, if I were writing for a BYU audience. So um, not the conclusion you get in the book. <laughs> My nieces are calling me out. I'm not suggesting BYU is not academic. <laughs> What I mean is um, a Latter-day Saint audience at BYU. Um, so let me return to where we began, back with uh, nine-year-old Charles Merrick, trembling with fear behind the bellows in the blacksmith shop. He teaches me important lessons about race and social justice. If you can racialize white Mormons, then no one is immune from the sting of racism. In 2018, in the United States of America, that is hauntingly clear. Racism is not a thing of the past, but a monster of the present, and I invite us all to learn its lessons from our own racial story. As I see it, the Latter-day Saint racial story has far less to do with supposedly divine curses than it has to do with the power of whiteness in American history. In fact, in telling the Mormon racial story, one ultimately tells the American racial story, and that American racial story is founded on the intoxicating principle of white supremacy. To combat white supremacy and racism in all of its forms, as Dr. Jacob Rue has taught me, we must be more than merely not racist, we must be anti-racist. If religion of a different color prompts any responses from you, I only hope that one of them might be a willingness to be anti-racist. Can we use the lack of social justice we sometimes experience as Latter-day Saints in the 19th century to stand in places of empathy when we see others experience social injustice in the 21st century, exactly because of the Latter-day Saints fraught racial past, not in spite of it. Racism did not become a sin only after June 1978. All are alike unto God did not appear in the Book of Mormon only after June 1978. God is no respecter of persons did not show up in the Bible and the Doctrine and Covenants only after June 1978 but sometimes we act as if they did because we are perhaps unprepared or unwilling to face our own racism. I personally believe that the universal message that has always been a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ is beautiful and liberating and that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints could be at the forefront of racial healing around the globe. Sadly, however, it sometimes feels like we are paralyzed by fear and maybe guilt over our own troubled racial past so much so that we don't speak up and we don't lead out. It doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to let our C pluses or even our Fs of the past define our present or our future. If we are to engage in acts of social justice, we cannot do so, in my estimation, without a healthy understanding of our shared racial story as Latter-day Saints and a willingness to bear the burden of racism that we all share. If we are a true and living church as we claim, and as the Savior taught us in his preface 
to the Doctrine and Covenants, then we are true and living only collectively, not individually. And by implication, the church that is true is in fact us, the members in all of our God-given diversity. Jesus teaches us in section one that his servants, that means followers and leaders alike, are weak. They are prone to error and they will sin. But collectively, he says, we are true and living. The church that is true is not, in other words, a building or a bureaucratic structure or the leaders in isolation from the followers, but rather it is us. And if we are true and living, then we are only true and living when we are one, when there are no more ites among us. But being one and eliminating the ites from among us does not mean that we don't recognize our differences. We are true and living when we are diverse in all of our shades of brown. We are true and living when we recognize God as the author of diversity and acknowledge our heavenly parents as the parents of the most diverse family on earth because all of us are their children. We are true and living when we see color and acknowledge that the way I might experience race as a white man might be different from the way my black, brown, or tan brothers and sisters experience race. We are true and living when we recognize that the way I might experience the shooting of nine parishioners in a Charleston, South Carolina church by a white supremacist might be different from the way one of my black brothers and sisters experiences that same shooting. And, I am going, and if I am going to mourn with those who mourn, I need to stand in places of empathy and listen and learn and speak up and pray up in our congregations and in our homes and in our hearts. And hopefully we do not need any more illustrations of the ways in which white supremacy works to understand that Jewish parishioners at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh died in a fit of racial rage, just like the parishioners in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina. Racism is heavy. It is easier to believe that it exists out there in the world and it is the world's problem and that it is the world's sin rather than to recognize that as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it is our problem and it is our sin too. Racism is even more weighty when the sources of that racism are people I revere as leaders of my faith. But as BYU's devotional speaker, Brian Stevenson advised last week, in order to help change the world, we have to do uncomfortable things. And owning our own racism is an incredibly inc uncomfortable thing. More often than not, when I share the Latter-day Saint racial story and talk about Brigham Young and other leaders' role in beginning and perpetuating it, people get understandably uncomfortable. We should be uncomfortable. Racism is heavy, but what we do with our discomfort is the more important question. What if we as Latter-day Saints collectively owned our racism? What if we did the work, learned about it, read about it, acknowledged it, felt uncomfortable with it, sat with its weight, and felt its burden on our souls? What if we collectively turned our racial weakness into a strength? What if we used our weakness to move forward in humility because we collectively came to understand the sting of racism deployed against us in the 19th century? After all, even our whiteness wasn't white enough. And what if we also started to lean into our own history, not just the hand carts and the crickets, not merely the persecution and the pioneers, but what if we did the work of changing the narrative to include the difficult parts of our past, the parts in which we produced, practiced, and participated in racism? What better people to stand in places of empathy on matters of racial injustice than Latter-day Saints? We understand racism's power to dehumanize and justify discriminatory policies, hatred, and violence because it was used against us. And we also understand racism's intoxicating lure because it enticed us to build our own racial ramiumptums in order to discriminate against our own brothers and sisters? What if we use our weakness on matters of race to move forward with humble strength? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Paul. We know that some of you may need to leave if you have a one o'clock class. Uh, we'll invite you to do that. I think we have 
uh, a few minutes, 10, 12 minutes or so, if anyone would like to ask a question of Professor Reeve. If you do, we'd invite you to come down here to the microphone. Uh, this is being recorded in that way. Uh, your question, as well as his response, will be a part of the recording. And we'll do that for 10 or 12 minutes. And I'll just say after that, if you have a copy of Professor Reeve's book, he will be available to sign it right outside uh, the auditorium here. So thank you. Any, any questions, please come down here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I have a question. Um, first of all, I'm uh, uh, neither a scholar uh, or a Mormon. I'm just an innocent bystander passing through town for about a month, and I very much appreciate your your presentation. I also enjoyed Brian Stevenson uh, last week, and it's uh, comforting, refreshing to, to see the church uh, repudiate some of its past teachings on race, and uh, commend you and, and your and your people for doing that. Um, my question is a little tangential but related. I'm wondering whether or not you feel that, in addition to repudiating the past related to race, there's an opportunity to repudiate the past as it relates to women, and that perhaps women may see the equality of the priesthood as men have enjoyed for the couple hundred years, or whether or not, as several LDS have said to me, that's just too ensconced in the Bible um, to be undone. Yeah, so um, I am a historian who has a difficult enough time figuring out the past that it's difficult to predict the future um, on those kind of issues, but um, I am familiar with uh, you know the, the, the parallels uh, that sometimes are drawn between the two issues. Uh, so uh, just as a historian, um, I sort of uh, I see the parallels in terms of hey, is this just a, a product of sort of our cultural understanding, right? Uh, but then there are also some, some distinctions as well. So for uh, race and the priesthood, uh, Joseph Smith establishes a precedent, uh, at least in the first couple of decades, there are black men ordained to the priesthood. You don't have a precedent for female ordination. Uh, and uh, so the other barrier or the other distinction is simply that uh, the race-based priesthood and temple restrictions prevent black Latter-day Saints from receiving all of the ordinances Latter-day Saints deem necessary to achieve exaltation, and women are not barred from receiving all of those ordinances. So uh, those are a couple of the distinctions. Now, bound up in Mormonism also is uh, a principle of continuing revelation, and so um, it's always open. It's always open for the possibility. Uh, I'm only just using history to suggest there are some perhaps parallels, but also some distinctions. I'm Cynthia Cannell, and I'm a Native American alumni president for BYU. And as a person who's Native American, I had a student come up to me last week who was black and ask me why Native Americans and Polynesians, or Lamanites, were given a preferential status over blacks in terms of how people relate to them. And I immediately understood because I have had experiences with individuals in their businesses who find out I'm Native American and praise me and tell me what a wonderful thing that is and then turn around and say racist things about black people and not in any way seem to think that I might find that offensive. Do you have any response that I can share? Sure. So um, in the book, uh, there, are, there are two chapters uh, called Red, White, and Mormon. So it looks at the ways in which uh, uh, Mormons are conflated with Native Americans, like I showed, uh, but also then the Mormon response. And uh, the Mormon response is informed by the Book of Mormon. Uh, so they read the Book of Mormon into who the Native Americans are. And uh, in this struggle for whiteness, then, uh, they see uh, their mandate is to redeem fallen Israel uh, and bring them with the white Mormons along, uh, along with them on their journey towards whiteness, uh, and then at the same time uh, leave uh, African Americans behind. 
Uh, so once again, um, claiming whiteness for yourself, uh, they believe that Native Americans could become white and delightsome through conversion, through intermarriage, uh, but uh, if you intermarry amongst African Americans, it brings the curse of Cain upon you and you lose uh, your potential for the priesthood and uh, temple blessings. And so those, that, that's the key distinction. Um, bringing Native Americans with them on their journey towards whiteness, leaving African Americans behind. Hello. I thought it was interesting you drew the distinction that the church um, isn't the bureaucratic organization, but it's the you know individuals who are members that we make the church. Because I think a lot of the times in our culture we talk about, oh, the church is different from the gospel. Um, so with the understanding that the church is actually all of us, um, I feel like there's still in our culture many misconceptions that even though uh, our leaders have made like very clear statements that you know we are all created equally, it's in our doctrine, there's still these misconceptions about it um, within you know individuals or congregations, etc. So as far as the church needing to take a stand on that or do something about it, do you think then that it's just for individual members to root out racism in their congregations, or do you think that as the leaders of the church, there should be more outright uh, statements regarding those things? Does that make sense? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, I, I think we all have a collective uh, obligation, and I'm, I'm drawing upon uh, this notion of the church just um, uh, in, in DNC one, collectively, not individually, thinking of us uh, in a way as, as a whole and a living church uh, as, as the individuals, right? And what obligation uh, do we have? I, I don't get to decide official policy, but I do get to decide how I treat others in the pews. Um, and uh, so uh, I think we need both, right? And we do have messaging coming from our leadership. If you look back over the last several general conferences, speaking out against racism, sexism, nationalism, uh, you know, th that kind of messaging uh, is there. Uh, hopefully it continues. Uh, there's also the race and the priesthood essay. Uh, the first presidency in the quorum of con uh, 12 have condemned all racism past and present. That includes within the church. Uh, we need to be educated. That's the hope, right, is that we are educated. We're up to speed on these kind of things so that uh, we can help our brothers and sisters in the pew uh, become a part of this true and living church, uh, to have a more um, uh, genuine understanding of our own racial past and, and use that to stand in places of empathy uh, in the present. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Hi. Uh, my question, I guess, is more about your personal journey in this book and this research. Um, so two questions. When you first came to the understanding yourself of this and needing to bring it out into the open, um, what was that experience? And then also, did you feel pushback in bringing something to light that maybe people didn't want to talk about, wasn't un wasn't comfortable for them, from both like the LDS community as well as the scholarly community? Uh, so the first part of the question, um, you know, it's it's it, it was a process for me in sort of coming to terms with with this. Uh, uh, started the research in 2007, uh, been engaged in it ever since. Um, and when I was writing, you know, uh, the conclusion for today, uh, racism is heavy is what kept coming to me because it, it feels very heavy over the last 10 years. Um, and sort of uh, the weight uh, of uh, the racism that was aimed at Mormons, but also the racism that, uh, you know, Mormonism uh, perpetuated feels very heavy. So, um, you know, um, none of the answers that existed uh, were sort of completely satisfying to me. And so uh, writing the book was one way of coming to terms with it for myself. Mm -hmm. And then the hope that um, it might be a potential answer that might satisfy other people. Uh, so in terms of its reception, uh, I've been, I've been uh, quite gratified. Uh, the academic community. Um, I had uh, dinner with Judith uh, Weisenfeld, who is a scholar of American religion at Princeton. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, she told me that she teaches the book in her American religions course at Princeton. I've been Skyped into a religion course at UVA, at George Mason University. 
Um, it's been assigned in a variety of locations by academic scholars who study American religion. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with the reception it's received there. Um, pushback, um, uh, more often than not, uh, comes um, you know amongst Latter-day Saints sometimes if I'm um, trying to translate to a, a more um, you know, faith-based audience, like at a fireside or something, uh, you might get the emails that come afterwards or the people that hang around um, and want to let you know that, um, for example, at a fireside in Seattle, a gentleman hung around, told me that my ideas, uh, he wanted to invite me back to debate my ideas publicly and that I would stand accountable before Brigham Young one day. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's the circle of the wagon uh, defends sort of, uh, you know, Brigham Young and his positions from 1852 that more often than not uh, is the pushback. Um, and, and I understand it. Um, I've been dealing with this, you know, for a lot of time, uh, for, for many years. And, um, you know, when people are first confronted with it, you try to situate it and, and figure out what that all means. Um, and so I think we have to give each other time and space to kind of work through it. Uh, but more often than not, that's, that tends to be the pushback. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. I really appreciated the lecture today. Thank you. Um, kind of similar to your previous question, but I was just wondering um, practical applications of employing this new narrative, not new narrative, but um, this different narrative in, in our church communities as well as our educational community here at BYU. Do you have any suggestions for that? Um, you know, I mean, uh, the best thing that I can uh, uh, hope is, is that we, we learn the history, we educate ourselves, and come to terms with what it means. And then um, we're willing to do the hard work of speaking up. I mean, sometimes it's intimidating uh, when we hear sort of old version of, of things uh, being perpetuated. Uh, and it creates discomfort, and it causes questions. Um, so if we can become familiar with it ourselves and be willing to uh, raise our hand and speak up when inaccuracies are being perpetuated, uh, you know, I guess that's a part of the hope, the part of, um, you know, can we come to terms with our own sense of, uh, of where we're at racially and um, be willing to say, hey, we got it wrong, uh, but we can stand in places of empathy because we understand that it was aimed at us and we also perpetuated it. So uh, therefore, we have firm ground uh, uh, to, to stand in places of empathy when we see racial injustice arise. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, hello. Uh, just a, a question, I, as I understand it, so, so when I was listening to your lecture, it seemed like there was a little bit of a gap. Um, you kind of made the argument that, uh, well, you, you pointed out sources with the kind of the conflation of religion and race and um, how essentially the, the religion was looked on as kind of a, what was it? Like kind of a degradation of the white race. Yeah. Um, and then we moved to kind of the present day and age where, where we see kind of the religion being attacked from a different angle where it's now like very white to the, the extent of being too white. So where did this shift happen um, kind of historically? I guess that's my question. Sure. Yeah, so uh, the, the overarching arc of the, the book is uh, Mormonism goes from not white enough in the 19th century to too white by the 21st century. Uh, and the last chapter is sort of broad brush stroke. So the majority of the book is uh, firmly situated in the 19th century. Last chapter is sort of broad brush strokes, 20th century. But I see the transition taking place. Uh, so Mormonism passes as white, uh, claims whiteness for itself around the turn of the 20th century by the 1920s, uh, really firmly um, uh, passes by the 1950s. Uh, so for example, Reed Smoot, uh, a sitting LDS apostle, uh, and uh, elected to the United States Senate. Uh, that's the context for the political cartoon published in Life magazine. But, uh, and, and it touches off a three a year long Senate hearing, will we allow a LDS apostle to retain his Senate seat? Uh, by the 1950s, Ezra Taft Benson, a sitting LDS apostle, is put into Eisenhower's administration, and Saturday Evening Post does a, a story on him 
sort of uh, exemplifying what it means to be white and middle class and successful in America. And so you see then uh, sort of Mormonism starting to uh, uh, symbolize uh, the American ideal by the 1950s. But uh, as soon as uh, Latter-day Saints arrive, the ground starts to shift, right? Because also in the 1950s, you have uh, the seedbeds of the Civil Rights Movement, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, and Latter-day Saints uh, start to dig in their heels as the rest of the nation sort of lurches towards uh, civil rights. Uh, and so that's where I see uh, the transition taking place uh, to where Mormons become known as too white uh, by uh, the late 20th century, early 21st century. Thank you. You're welcome.